on YouTube. Well, everybody. Mm, I just, um, I feel like I'm having a bad hair day. <laughs> Having a bad hair day every day. I am. Oh my gosh. I'm having a bad hair day. I'm just not looking how I I don't feel like I'm looking presentable. <laughs> how am I, Marcus? Okay. Hi. Hi, YouTube. All right. Hello, Let's go ahead and go live on Insta. I feel like it's a slow start for me today. Happy Friday. All right, we're live on Insta. I'm going to see if I can put on a face filter. <laughs> Hi, Instagram. Oh, there's Dr. Q. Dr. Q, we're the first one in. All right. <laughs> That's because I'm sitting here waiting. <laughs> Dr. Q, you you really got the hang of all of this. Yeah. Oh, there I am. Happy Friday, guys. Dr. Q will be joining us any second here. Hello, everybody. Oh, there we go. You guys okay. didn't tell me. Time to you stop guys me didn't with tell me. <laughs> you didn't tell me that I could all this time I could have had a filter on my face like all the pimples oh. you endured all of the you know just <laughs> my goodness happy Friday everyone um sorry for the slow start it's been one of those Fridays Please share where you are tuning in from we'll shout out some places and go ahead and Put any questions you have in the comments and we'll go ahead and get started here. And I can go ahead and start with our first question that was sent in um, from, uh, from our stories. And these are actually pretty uh, three pretty good questions. Uh, taking folic acid, does it help with pain crisis? Folic acid... Well, every if you have a hematologist, probably they've prescribed folic acid for you, and there, it's kind it's it's to help. The idea is to help your bone marrow make more red blood cells because folic acid is one of the essential vitamins in that cycle. So um, there have been studies to show that if you're in a uh, you know, if you eat bread and flour kind of stuff, it's all, it's, it, there's folate in all of that. So taking folic acid doesn't really make a huge difference, but for sure uh, it wouldn't help you with your pain. So folic acid is just to increase your hemoglobin a little bit. Most people are not deficient in folic acid. So the the actual benefit of it is not great unless you just don't eat bread and cereal and stuff like that because that's all uh fortified with folate. well i fortified here in the u.s um in other places will, would it be fortified well if you're like in africa someplace or in a third world country probably not but i think in europe everywhere it's because it's it's a it it's a benign vitamin that helps everybody who who um, with your with your uh, uh, metabolism and your blood formation. So it's okay. there's no downside to taking. There's no downside to it. So if you take it, that's fine. Okay. Um. So that was a question sent in. I see someone from Guyana. Hello. Bower County, Florida, Nigeria. How how are you doing, those of you in Nigeria? How after we, you know, <laughs> lost that Afcon? Oh my gosh, it was a stressful game for me. Um, <laughs> if you know, you know. If you know, you know. Um, Texas, UK, Philadelphia. We always have someone from Philly. I love it. All right, 
Um, Please feel free to send any questions that you have for Dr. Q. We're looking for the especially hard ones. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and do our second question here. Is it difficult to find life insurance for people living with sickle cell? Uh, it can be, yes. And it depends. I think it depends on your age and whether you have complications of your sickle cell disease. But um generally i would i i would say it's not easy but there definitely are people and ways you can get um life insurance but again anybody with a chronic illness you're going to pay more for it um so it's possible but you'd have to search around for it i don't think it would be uh, particularly hard, easy to get. I saw a couple of questions pop up there. Okay. Um, Thank you for right. the questions, by the way, all you Instagram watchers. So I see here, opinion on stem cell transplant. I'm currently admitted and getting the procedure done. So if you can talk about um, stem cell transplant and gene therapy, Dr. Q, and um, what are your opinions on it? And I guess to, to even zero that down even further, um, how does one assess whether they should be a candidate for, you know, a curative option? Okay, so gene therapy is approved, well, the interesting thing about the gene therapy, and I could be wrong about this because I I don't I just I read things, but you know I'm, I don't practice medicine anymore, but I'm still a doctor. So it seems to me that the what the entry into gene into bone marrow transplant depends on, and this is just in the United States. It depends on on the. Uh, CMS or the government insurance. So if they approve gene therapy or they, I don't know why I keep saying, it, they approve bone marrow transplant, then private insurances also will approve bone marrow transplant. But right now, the only easily approved and paid for bone marrow transplant in the United States is for an HLA match sibling. There are studies for other kinds of transplant, like it's called haploidentical, or someone in your family who is half HLA matched to you, there are studies to see whether or not that's equal to an HLA matched sibling. And there are some other bone marrow transplant studies as well. So even in bone marrow transplant, if you don't fit into this HLA match sibling category, which means you have a brother or sister who has who is identical in the in the HLA typing that they use to find donor to, to find donors uh, for uh, transplant, if that doesn't apply to you, then it, you'd almost have to be in a study. Okay, um, and bone marrow transplant for HLA identical siblings is very is it has taken leaps and bounds they've changed the the conditioning um and it's 95 percent or 98 percent of people who have a hla match sibling donor are survive and about 85 percent or so have no complications and that they have engraftment and they're cured from sickle cell so the survival is higher than the actual cure for sickle cell disease. And you kind of have to look at that. So anything time you do anything like this, there's a consent and you have to really talk to the doctor, understand the consent, know what the side effects are, know what the, the survival is before you do it. Okay, so that's, that's a bone marrow transplant. Okay, gene therapy. Gene therapy is not even though it's approved, it's by the FDA, two different types of gene therapy. It's not readily available right now in the United States because the only 
the only people probably where you could get a get gene therapy would be one of the centers who was in the gene therapy studies where they've already got everything set up to do the gene therapy you know they they have a laboratory where they they send your uh, progenitor cells and they get transformed and then they get transfused back into back into you as you you are the donor for yourself um so that is uh, that that is one kind of downside for it the other one is is that it's very expensive so you might have to go if you were say in a uh, near a center that did gene therapy you'd have to go some hoops with your insurance company to pay for it and that kind of thing. Um, gene therapy is uh, has the issue with gene therapy versus transplant is you're getting your own cells back. So there's nothing called graft versus host disease. Um, there are fewer side effects. The, 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 difference be, the other difference between gene therapy and bone marrow transplant is gene therapy is brand new. And problems that start, Problems that you might have with gene therapy or even a transplant sometimes don't really occur for five years or so, two to five years or even longer. So gene the people who have received gene therapy, they haven't, they really haven't had the procedure 15 years ago. So nobody knows what the long-term effects of gene therapy are. Although the assumption is that once your progenitor cells are transformed that they they will be just like part of your the rest of you and they'll last for forever or for a long long time but nobody knows that for sure the other thing is when you have gene therapy all of it doesn't completely change every single cell in your bone marrow to make normal hemoglobin or the hemoglobin that's prescribed so um you still have some of your own bone marrow cells left producing some sickle cell. Um, so that's, that's another issue with the, with the gene therapy, but it's the gene therapy itself is safe. What tends to be a problem or what has popped up as a problem is the conditioning with busulfan. So busulfan, like all chemotherapy type drugs has side effects. One of them has turned out to be um, increasing your risk of AML, which is a lethal, very difficult to treat camp, uh, uh, yeah. blood cancer. Very rare, extremely rare, but it does, it has occurred. Yeah. Uh, there is a follow-up question here, which I haven't ever heard uh, this question before. Gene therapy, why does having alpha thal with uh, double double deletion or uh, two deletions make gene therapy difficult? That's a good question that I can't answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was really, really technical. Uh, I will, yeah, the person who, who I asked would that. I, I would have to look that up because I'm not sure why gene therapy with a double dele alpha uh, gene deletion would make it more, I'm trying to think of why that would make it more difficult. Because you know, the, the gene for sickle cell disease is, on, is, is not on the alpha gene, it's on the beta. So I don't know that, I don't know what that, that problem is. That muddies the water. I'd have to look it up. But yeah. you can write to the Ask Dr. Q, on sickle cell 101 and when i look it up i will answer your question but yeah I please I... please do write in because i actually want to know too because i'm single gene deletion alpha yeah. thalassemia so um and i actually have a lot of questions for you like on the severity of your sickle cell if you yes. have um you know two deletions and i have one so it makes my ss more mild um Sometimes, I guess, because my sister has the same thing, but she's sick a lot. But generally speaking, the single gene deletion of the alpha uh, thalassemia makes your red blood cells a little bit smaller, um, to my understanding, which makes it easier uh, for them to kind of maneuver through small uh, vessels. So um, 
Is your that right? Your hemoglobin's higher, and you generally do much better, except that, as some as some people will tell you, it increases your risk of avascular necrosis. Okay. And I definitely got avascular necrosis, so the, there you go. Um, I I saw a comment here. It says, "Hi, my uh, hi, a fellow warrior. My husband passed away on January twenty first. He was fifty one. He got the flu, which started the downward spiral. And I just want to let you know, my heart goes out to you. I'm so 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 sorry about that. I can't even imagine what you're going through right now, and." Um, I, I think I saw something about a follow-up message surrounding um, him not being able to get life insurance. And so just want to share that, you know, I saw your comment and I'm just so sorry to hear and see that. And, and my condolences to you for that. Um, I have um, a question here says, um, my two grandsons have sickle cell disease, wanting to know if she should allow my two-year-old grandson to travel out of the country. I'm so nervous about it. And then the follow-up comment is, Indonesia is where they're going in August. And I laugh because I went to Indonesia and I got really, really, really sick there. So if somebody with sickle cell is going to Indonesia, to me, that's a red flag, um, and I'll I'll tell you briefly why. Um, they didn't have, uh, they couldn't type and cross my blood. I got really, really sick there. My hemoglobin dropped very, very low there. I actually got like a flu or a bug on the airplane and went into crisis, went to a local hospital. Um, it was like the one that all the expats went to, so it, it actually was like the best one around in that area. I was in Lumbuck. And um, they couldn't give me blood. And so my hemoglobin just kept dropping, 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 dropping. And it got to a point where like, you need to get out of this country because the whole, I couldn't even fly to Jakarta, the capital. No no place could give me blood because they couldn't type cross, cross type my blood. Um, and so they, it pretty much got to a point where they're like, you have to get a um, air ambulance to Singapore if you, if you want to live pretty much. I like you, you, you'll die in this country if you don't get out like ASAP. Um, so please keep that in mind. Don't do what I did. You know, I hadn't been sick. I hadn't been hospitalized for like probably five years prior to that. So I was like feeling super confident about my health and they just don't know enough about sickle cell there. And now when I decide I want to travel, I look, for if they know how to treat uh, sickle cell, you know, they have a hematologist oncologist who is familiar with sickle cell because not every hematologist or oncologist know about sickle cell. So I would just caution you, you know, I don't want to um, ruin a trip plans or, and, you know, hopefully, you know, nothing like that would ever happen to you. But I just wanted to share my experience that I got really, really sick there, almost died. Um, you know, as soon as they said I needed an air ambulance, my husband gets on the phone and he's like, um, you know, I need to get air. He's on the phone with insurance and insurance and there, the doc, the hospital is like, she has probably like till the end of the day, you know, or like, you know, very, very limited time to get out of here before I, I die. And my husband's on the phone. He's like, you know, three to five business days, the insurance people are telling him three to five business days. And, you know, it's just, we don't have that time. And he actually got somebody transferred to somebody who her father passed away from sickle cell. And she expedited the whole thing. And I got out there just in the nick of time. So I was really, really very, very lucky. Um, and if I was going to say, if you want to travel to that part of the world, Singapore, they know everything about sickle cell. Like their healthcare is amazing. And I think the flight was only like an hour or two from from uh where we were to Singapore. You probably have to fly into Singapore first before uh, uh going over to Indonesia. So um just do do your research, do your research when when traveling um because it I could have like things could have uh actually turned out for the worse there and I 
<laughs> I, you guys are gonna laugh. There's these memes that these these Nigerian memes I've been seeing going around, and I'm Nigerian, and they said Nigerians are so poetic. And it, like the th the phrase that comes to mind is like a Nigerian saying, "I cannot die in another man's country. I cannot die in another man's country." And <laughs> that's how I felt. Like, no, at least let me die back in the U.S. where I'm from and with family and everything. So. I don't mean to be dramatic. I don't mean to scare you all, but please, please, please do your research um, uh, surrounding that because not every country is equipped to handle sickle cell. Sickle cell is like high maintenance, you know, on a day to day and like in emergency situations. And so it, you need a lot to support sickle cell. And if you get sick, there, there has to be what, you know, what Cassandra is talking about, there has to be infrastructure. There has to be some kind of hospital system where they have blood banks, they know how to type and cross blood, they know how to find, determine if to find blood for you if you have, have what's called alloimmunization or antibodies against some blood uh, proteins. And it can be, you know, this kind of story is the kind of thing that you're, you will probably not hear anywhere else except here, because that is, so informative for people traveling with sickle cell. You'd have to do your homework. Um, the the person asked if they can send this live. I believe you can send the live, but all of our lives are always um, on our page. So if somebody misses the live, they can always come back and uh, watch the live on our Instagram page. And then now it's also on YouTube as well. So. Um, if you want to share that with somebody, please, please, please do. And if they want to talk, I can tell you, like, I can tell you so, some of the details and everything. And <laughs> I, I was talking to Dr. Q, Dr. Q on Speedo. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but like in yeah. and out of consciousness, like just, it was a mess. It was, a mess. was I'm thinking about my daughter. I was like, how could I do this to my daughter? Oh my gosh. Like, oh. Uh, it was it was pretty tense. It, yeah, it was a very traumatic um, experience. And I haven't the good news is I haven't been sick since I haven't been hospitalized since. And this was back in 2017. So um, thankfully, um, I'm, I'm that much wiser for it, though. Like, you know, I, I still do travel. But when I plan trips, do they know how to give me blood? Do they know about sickle cell? You know, just it's it's a lot more thorough. So. It's not to we you because I still travel, even like, you know, my mom doesn't want me to go nowhere after that. N nobody wants me to go nowhere after that. But I've been to places after that. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a way to do it. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. The email um, you can uh, you can uh, send an email to ask at SC101 dot org um dr q's email is k carollo at sc101.org as well um k q u i r o l o at sc101.org and thank you guys for the, the nice messages i'm happy i'm here i'm still i can <laughs> i live to tell the story uh, i'm like don't do that <laughs> don't, don't go to indonesia <laughs> uh all it's right. funny now, but it wasn't funny then. I know. You know what? I I just be laughing through everything. It's not even that. It's not a funny. It's not funny at all. But That's really um, scary. all right, great, great question. I'm glad you you mentioned that. Um, can painkillers cause psychological damage, like schizophrenic schizophrenic episodes, if taken randomly? No. Uh, there's a lot of side effects to opioid medications, but that's not that's not one of them. Um, yeah. Especially if you're, you know, you're taking prescription medications. So um, if you're taking prescription medications, it should there shouldn't be anything that could cause a problem. But there are a lot of problems with uh, opioids. And um, if you write me, I will send you the long list. But it's it's not, it's, they're rare, but you can have bad things happen while you're taking opioids uh, chronically. So if you take opioids for like months at a time, 
uh, it affects your endocrine system and it's there's a lot of side effects. Okay. Um, I haven't seen this question before. Is it difficult to have a baby when you have had multiple transfusion reactions and currently have antibodies? It's not difficult. No. Okay. So let's back. Yeah. It, you could have problems with hemolytic disease of the newborn. That's a possibility. But you, what you would have to do would be to talk to your uh, a uh, OBGYN, high risk uh, OBGYN, uh, 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 they, you know, the person who's going to help deliver, and also a transfusion medicine specialist. So a transfusion medicine specialist would be able to take a look at your at your uh, your alloimmunization or your antibodies, and they could figure out whether any of those would be an issue that would affect the baby. The other thing would be to look at the father of the baby to see what his um, what his genotype was or phenotype on his red blood cells to see if there was something there that could be a problem. So for instance, you know, the, the thing that everybody talks about is RH incompatibility, where a mom is RH uh, negative and the baby's RH positive, and then that causes hemolysis of the baby's red cells, and it's an exchange transfusion. It can be a big deal after the baby's born. There's another uh, equally, not quite as severe, but severe, and that's KELL. K-E-L-L. -L. So if you have anti-KEL antibodies and your baby ha is KEL positive, then you can have a similar thing happen. And those are, that's very common. Um, so you'd have to uh, figure out whether or not that, that could be an issue with you. Um, and a, a transfusion medicine doctor and your OBGYN could, could, per, could, get ready for a problem if you were to have it. So um, it's the pregnancy is not the issue. It's the baby being born and your antibodies attacking the baby's red blood cells. And someone just says, I have antibodies and have three children. So yes, it's there only in certain special circumstances would it be a problem. I was going to say my sister has antibodies and has three kids too. Um, but with sickle cell disease, you always have to be sure it's going to be okay. It's If I learned anything about taking care of people with sickle cell disease is it's very unpredictable and you have to be ready for everything. Um, I used Hydria for one year and have bone depression. Is there a correlation, Dr. Q? Yes, if you're on a high, well, there's, I, I never encountered anybody, but you, hydroxyurea causes bone marrow depression. So if you're on a high dose of hydroxyurea, your white count goes down, your hemoglobin goes down, and it can be relatively serious for you, which is why you get, when you start hydroxyurea, this is the way I did it. I don't know if it's okay now or not, but what I would do is check somebody in two weeks to make sure that their dose was okay and they weren't having bone marrow suppression. Then I, if they weren't, I would continue that dose and then I would check them again in a month or you know, sometime around that time just to be sure. And then I'd check people every two months it's just to be sure that they we're doing okay with the, with the hydroxyurea. The other thing is some people would have intermittent problems with their platelet count would go down, their hemoglobin would go down. And usually if it wasn't really seriously down, I, I would stop the hydroxyurea, wait for a few weeks, recheck, make sure their hemoglobin was back up, everything was okay. And sometimes I could restart the hydroxyurea at the same dose or a little bit lower dose and then check to make sure it was okay. But yes, if you, 
you could have bone marrow suppression with hydroxyurea, especially if the dose was too high. And if the dose was too high and nobody's checking your counts, we just go down, 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 down. So you got to be checked at, at intermittently. And for me, it was every two months to make sure that your hemoglobin was doing okay at that dose. And it has been shown in Africa, fixed doses of hydroxyurea that are on the lowest side still are protective and you don't have to check your blood as often. But those are relatively low doses of hemoglobin or hemo of hydroxyurea that will not suppress your hemoglobin or the rest of your bone marrow. And so that those studies have been done because in Africa it, you, it's hard to get blood work done every couple of weeks and it's expensive. Okay. Um, going through the comments here. Is it safe for a mild sickle cell patient to take an ice bath after working out? Uh, I would have to say no. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know why you'd want to take an ice bath after ice bath. Well, why, why do athletes do that? I think athletes do that. Uh, like, it probably decreases inflammation. So if you okay. were out, like say playing football and you got knocked around a lot and you had uh, like potentially bruising all over or your joints were kind of, that would decrease inflammation. Um, uh, it must work for athletes because if they do it, but for someone with sickle cell, it would vasoconstrict it make your vessels in your skin very much smaller. Um, and so that, that could lead to like uh, an a ep episode of pain. Um, it would, uh, a lot of people can't go swimming in cold water. I know when we did sickle cell camp, the camp heated the pool so people with sickle cell could um, uh, swim in it. And people who, like to go out in t-shirts when it's like 50 degrees out or lower, they usually have pain afterwards. Okay. I, I th This person that said that they, they work out, they're right about stretching before and after your workout. You, there's a lot of things you can do just to make things better. Hydrate yourself, drink a lot of water, stretch, make sure that you're, you're, you know, and don't overdo it. Just, um, I, I personally knew a few, uh, they were, turns out they were all males, but they were weightlifters with sickle cell disease and they were pretty yeah. buff, I was telling yeah. you. And they didn't bother them. They didn't have problems with their sickle cell disease, but they probably did what this person is saying. They probably, um, you know, they stretched, they drank lots of fluids, and they just took care of their health. There's a there's a lot of things you can do with sickle cell disease that if you take care of yourself, you're, you're going to be okay. I mean, if you go on the site, there's an NBA basketball player who has sickle cell. So, Yes, uh, you guys, we are talking with him. To, thank you. That was a good uh, segue. <laughs> we are talking to the very first NBA player diagnosed with sickle cell disease, Billy Garrett Jr. We are have we're going live with him tomorrow. So um I believe details are on our page on our feed and probably in their story. But his name is Billy Garrett Jr. He wrote a book about his journey to getting to the NBA. So it's amazing. He has sickle cell disease, not sickle cell traits, sickle cell disease. Um, so there's definitely ways to do uh, some of the stuff. It's just, you know, you got to listen to your body and make sure um, you are taking it slow, um, slow and steady. Think, I feel like I've heard, you know, when people were growing up, doctors say, hey, don't exercise because it can be a trigger for sickle cell. And, you know, I, I, I really do think it's an individual basis, um, but I I don't ever think moving your body and getting blood circulation is ever bad. 
uh, for sickle cell. Um, what do you have any particular thoughts around like, you know, exercise and sickle cell in general? I think, you know, the, the major thing is avoiding dehydration. So you have to really hydrate. You can't, you can't exercise and lose your kidneys do not concentrate your urine. So most people with sickle cell disease, they have to go to the bathroom a lot because their kidneys are not concentrating their, their urine. And, and so you're losing a lot of fluid just by urinating. The other thing is if you're sweating and you're really working out, you're again, losing a lot of fluid. And, you, and the more dehydrated you get, the more likely it is that you're gonna have sickling and you're gonna have aches and pains and not feel very well. The other thing is, is you have to get, you, you have to, you can't just one day decide I'm gonna run a mile just because I'm 20 and I can run a mile. You can't do that mm -hmm. if you have sickle cell, but you can work up to that. The other thing is it depends on your hemoglobin. Some people with sickle cell disease have high levels of fetal hemoglobin and they also maybe have high-ish levels of just red blood cells. And those people can work out and, and run and do things more than some other people. So everybody with sickle cell is different. No two people with sickle cell disease are the same. Some people with sickle cell disease, they have a hemoglobin of 9.5, 8.5. Other people have their, their normal hemoglobin is like seven. That's or me. 6.5. Those mm -hmm. people cannot run a marathon. You can't exercise a lot if you're anemic. My hemoglobin's 15. So if you're, well, I'm old now, so you could probably outrun me for sure. <laughs> I, I'm sure I couldn't. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if your hemoglobin is seven and my hemoglobin's 14, I have a lot more oxygen delivery. I'm not going to have a problem. And plus, I don't have sickle cells. So if you take care of yourself and pace yourself, you can, you can do. If somebody can play NBA basketball, you have to know more about him and you'll learn about it tomorrow. Yeah. But, um, they're, they're, you, you, you have to have some kind of medical help to do that because you can't just think you can walk out the door and run a mile you'll you won't you won't be happy afterwards especially if you don't drink a lot of fluids you get sick yeah i'll just say quickly before um addressing the leg ulcer question thank you for uh resurfacing that i i try and exercise as much as i can and i actually feel better when i do exercise um so i'll try and uh, walk up i I don't do like anything special. Like you won't see me on the treadmill or like anything fancy. I walk up hills though. Like I like walking up hills because it gets my heart rate and I go at my own pace. Like I don't, I don't like, you know, try and hustle and act like, you know, I have like Lululemons on, but like, I don't put them to work. Like they, they're just there for protection. Like, you know, I don't really need workout clothes, but I do walk up like hills um, and it gets my heart rate going up and, and, you know, that I know that's good for me and, and circulation and all that. And I'll try and do that 30 minutes a day, um, every day. So find out what you enjoy. I don't like all the other stuff. I really don't. I really like walking. I like walking in general or like hiking, um, as long as, and if it's steep, I don't think I mind, but I will take my time going up that hill. Like, you know, it might take somebody two minutes to get up to the top of the hill. I'm going to take my time. Um, but I think the goal is really to get your heart rate going and, you know, get your blood circulating and all of that. So find what you like. I like yoga, too. And I like yoga and Pilates, too. So, yeah. Um, and, and it's really it's really important if you have sickle cell disease and if you're a parent of a child with sickle cell disease to let them exercise. You know, you're more, you're anemic maybe, but you can, you still need to be, you still need to be exercising. And some people have problems, not be, not so much from their anemia as the fact they're way out of shape. They never, they're afraid, you know, your parent, your mom tells you don't, don't do this, don't do that, which on some level is true. 
but you do have to exercise like Cassandra does to your, to, you, you shouldn't be exhausted. You should just feel like you've gotten some exercise. I was, yeah, I was going to say the key is not to do it perfect or do it well. It's just to do it. And that's really what I have in my head. It's like, you know, you know, when you try and make a, a something a habit, you want to give it your own. You want to do it well every single time. But what's more important is the fact that you actually get up and do it than doing it well. So even if like, you know, yesterday I walked for 30 minutes and then today I'm not feeling it. And so instead of me just not walking, I'll just walk for 10 minutes as opposed to the 30 minutes, just to, for the fact to, to get up and do it. Of course, now, if you're in like a lot of pain, obviously address that, right? And take care of yourself and, and do what you need to do. But it's not to do it perfect. It's to do, it's just to do it um, and, and forming that habit so that, you know, you stay active all the time and it becomes second nature to you. So that's my little two cent advice for from the non-athletic person. Um, <laughs> please join the live tomorrow. You will get a real athletic person with sickle cell disease. He will probably share all the gems you all want to know about it. So yeah, tomorrow's live is with Billy Garrett Jr., uh, NBA, former NBA player. And I can't wait to to tune in and well, listen to Tell people story. the times. I don't know. That's why I didn't tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... It's on our page, and I don't want to yeah. hop off, the, cancel the live. I think, just to I, check think for, I think for Pacific time, it's it's like nine o'clock or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. But I don't uh, know. I don't know about the other time zones. It'll also. I think every time we do a live, it'll sit on our page. So if you can't make it tomorrow, you know, feel free to check out our page, and it'll be there. The conversation. Um, yeah. So. Um, Somebody asked about having a leg ulcer, but I'm not qu quite sure what the specific question is around the leg ulcer. Um, but Dr. Q, can you speak to having leg ulcers with, with sickle cell? And I, I know this could potentially be a regional thing um, or like depending on location, you there might be more of a prevalence or... So leg ulcers are more common in... Uh... Uh, tropical climates and the problem the reason is because you don't wear shoes you you're barefoot or you don't have high tops on or something like that so you have some minor injury to your ankle or to your leg and um, it can lead to a skin ulcer it, not every single injury is going to do that it's not clear really why some people have leg ulcers and some people don't tend to have leg ulcers. I think they're more common in males just because guys are out doing Y'all are rough with your bodies. Yeah, but, <laughs> but they, can, they, are, they start off sometimes, well, the ones that I've been, had experience with, they start off as a painful small area on your skin usually around your ankles or something like that and it it's the ones that i've seen usually there's some little area of what you would call necrosis it's kind of black skin darkened skin and then that becomes worse and it opens up and you have an open ulcer wherever that was and they're really painful they're very, very painful. Um, and as soon as that happens, you really need to, you know, get in touch with your primary care physician if you think you have something like that going on. And then you need to, if it opens, then you need to have a wound specialist. There are people in the United States and urban areas where there's a lot of medical care. They actually have people who do wound therapy. And they will figure out a way for you to try to minimize the amount of, uh, of uh, area that's covered and keep it and keep it so that it's not as painful. Um, they take a long time to heal, sometimes weeks, maybe a month or even more. And the skin that 
over those leg ulcers afterwards is a little bit uh, thin. So they reoccur frequently. So once you've had a pain, if you have an ulcer, say around your ankle or something like that, then you're gonna have to uh, probably wear high tops or protect that ankle for, for a while until it's really healed up. It's, yeah. it, it's not an easy, it's really one of the most difficult to treat things in sickle cell disease. So if you uh, could look for your, uh, it's called a, a pain, uh, what is the specialist called? A wound specialist. A wound specialist, okay. Try so and those, find a... Mm -hmm. Those are people who work, like some people have to have like, uh, um, they have something wrong with their intestine and they have to wear a little bag and that area gets really inflamed or damaged or whatever. And so those people, that's what they do. That's what they handle mostly, but other kinds of insults like a uh, leg ulcer, they're, they can, they're the right people to do it. But you have to talk to your primary care doctor, get a referral, and uh, hopefully you can get it. it it's, uh, it's really a big problem. It's very painful. That's, that's one of the big things with it. It's really, really painful. Yeah. And then try to protect yourself and, you know, if you're- Protect the wound. Yeah, well, protect yourself from getting it. Wear high, you know, wear high top shoes or uh, stuff like that. Okay. okay. Um, I really love the questions you guys are sending in. Yeah. Um, there's a couple around pregnancy. Uh, there's one that says any tips for first pregnancy with sickle cell. Hey, I have sickle cell. I just found out I was pregnant. Do you have any tips? So I think uh, Cassandra knows all about that. <laughs> but <laughs> I was pregnant once, yes. <laughs> I do and have a, a daughter. So, you know, you need to have a regular OBGYN. You need to have a high-risk OBGYN. You need to have a high-risk um person who takes care of the baby and you need to have your hematologist, your primary care doctor involved. Um, generally speaking, um, people with sickle cell disease, obviously, if you, you know, you, you know people have had children, so it's not impossible, but you do have to have, it, it's, you're a high risk person if you have sickle cell disease and you're yeah. pregnant. And yeah. some people, um, and if you're on hydroxyurea, it's recommended that you stop the hydroxyurea. Um, and some people at the end of their pregnant, everybody who's pregnant has anemia because you double your blood volume. So think about that. If you double your blood volume, it's not blood, it's fluid. And so that's why sometimes you get uh, a little bit of edema when you're pregnant. You have a lot of extra fluid, so your hemoglobin goes down. And if your hemoglobin goes down, then you're more at risk for other problems with your sickle cell. So occasionally it's kind of, I think it's still controversial. It wasn't for me, but it might be for some people. At the end of your pregnancy in the third trimester, when your hemoglobin is down, you do chronic transfusions. And those are usually simple transfusions where you just increase your hemoglobin, um, but they, they could be other kinds of transfusions like an exchange. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of um, some really helpful advice um, for when I was uh, pregnant. I will just say, so I have SS and my sister has SS and we both, so I have one kid and my sister has three kids and both of our experiences were completely different. Um, we we are the same, uh, I guess, genotyp genotype uh, or genotypically, um, is that, if that's a word. Um, so my pregnancy was, was pretty uneventful. I think throughout the whole pregnancy, I got one transfusion, um, where things kind of started to happen was, um, towards the end of the pregnancy where I started to develop preeclampsia and they said that they needed to uh, induce me at 37 weeks. And so, uh, that was scheduled and, um, I was induced at 37 weeks and had my daughter and um like i said pretty uneventful 
And my sister, on the other hand, she was in the hospital probably on a monthly basis because of pain. Um, and one of the things is, in you know, uh, speak with your hematologist and have your hematologist work with your high risk uh, pregnancy doctor, your OBGYN on what your specific plain, pain plan will be for when you're pregnant. Because I know a point, a pain point for my sister was, you know, when she'd go into the ER, she wouldn't, they wouldn't give her, you know, pain meds the same way that they did when she wasn't pregnant. And so it's, it comes into play, like, you know, do you, you know, protect the mother or the baby or how, how you kind of, um, maneuver through that type of situation. So make sure you have very, very thorough conversations surrounding what pain plans should look like. And, you know, if you already had a pain plan before your pregnancy, make sure it's updated so that, you know, if, if in the case you have to go in, um, you know, you have something current and, you know, something that um, can guide care surrounding, you know, you being specifically pregnant with sickle cell disease. Um, I'm trying to think what else I, I, I did follow a high risk, um, a high risk, I'm blinking out a high risk doctor, uh, for my pregnancy. And, um, I probably went in on a monthly basis and had to do like tests on a monthly basis. So I wasn't working at the time when I was pregnant. Um, and so I can imagine it being, a lot, especially if you're high risk pregnancy, a lot of back and forth between, you know, the uh, care center that I, there is no way I could work during that time. Um, if I, even if I wanted to, it's just like, you know, and then especially towards the end or, you know, especially in the third trimester, you go like almost sometimes every other day or, you know, just to monitor the baby. Um, so it, it is really time consuming. Um, I think I got tired as normal and everything, else, but that that was really it. So if you have any specific questions around my pregnancy, feel free to to ask. But I I don't remember anything like. Uh, luckily, I had a pretty uneventful pregnancy up until like the thirty seven weeks, and I I know a lot of people who develop preeclampsia and have to get induced at thirty seven weeks. My sister, I think, had to do that for all three of her babies. I think she had two with C section. And then uh, one vaginally, and then I had mine vaginally. So, um, yeah, that that was my pregnancy, and and now my daughter's nine years old. So it's like I I'm a kid with a kid. Um, <laughs> she's she's healthy, <laughs> she's fine. She has a trait, of course, because I have SS, so I can only give her an S, and my husband can only give her an A. So all of our kids, if we decide to have more kids, which we're not, um, will have AS. So. She will always have trait and all of my sister's kids will always have at least trait. You know, it depends on your partner, of course. Um, but if you have SS, you all your kids will at least have trait. Um, all right. So that is my that's what happened to me when I was pregnant. Um, OK, I don't really see any follow up questions around that, but feel free to, to reach out around that. I want to get to this question here. Um, I am 48 year old woman with mild sickle cell. What should I be looking out for at this age? I like this well, question. Yeah, I think, you know, if you have sickle cell disease, if you have SS, the things that you should be looking out for, number one would be renal function. So, yeah, I don't know what type of sickle cell disease you have, but most people with sickle cell disease, even sickle cell trait, have a higher incidence of kidney problems. So that, that's one thing. Make sure that your, gen, your, uh, your doctor uh, keeps track of your kidney function. The other thing would be to make sure your, um, your uh, lung function is okay. And uh, the other thing would be to um, Make sure that your heart function is okay and that you're not iron overloaded. So iron overload, most people who have sickle cell disease over their lifetime, they get transfusions depending, it could be a lot. And 
the, the weird thing about iron is there's lots of iron in, in a blood transfusion because that's what helps hemoglobin carry the oxygen is iron. And once that iron gets into your body, it doesn't come out. Your body does not have a mechanism for getting rid of iron. So it just builds up in your body. The skin that sloughs off of your body contains iron, but that's not going to affect your total body iron. So when you get to be 48 or younger even, at once in a while, you should just, and you've had more than 10 transfusions, you should just make sure that your iron is okay because that will affect your heart, your kidneys, um, and other things. Um, I'm trying to think. Your heart and your kidneys, your lungs, those are the primary things. But what you really need, besides all that, is you need to have a really good primary care doctor who knows about adults with sickle cell. Because I was a pediatrician, and when I when I started doing sickle cell, you know, it was there weren't that many adults. They just people did not survive with sickle cell to be forty eight. So most of the most of the older people I knew were in their twenties. So as time has changed, now there's a lot of now I know a few people who are in their seventies with sickle cell. So you need to continue to have a hematologist or somebody who knows something about sickle cell and can track to make sure that your kidneys are okay, your heart's okay, your lungs are okay, um, and that just your general health, you know, your eyes, you don't have retinopathy. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with sickle cell. Um, and it's like we've said before, it's different for everybody. So you need, you know, a whole body check to make sure everything's okay. And don't forget just general aging, right? Like sickle cell doesn't omit you from general aging and, and issues that can happen right. when you, when you're getting older. So, right. um, a lot of times we always think about sickle cell, but, you know, we, other things can happen to us. Right. And so just keep it, you know, your general health in mind as well. Um, make your primary care physician, your best friend. Right. Um, yeah, these questions are coming in and <laughs> I don't know what to ask next. Um, this one is in, in the topic of, you know, um, reproductive health. Should male stop hydroxyurea if they are trying to have babies? Uh, does it uh, do to it leaching into the sperm? So there's two there's two reasons why you should um, stop hydroxyurea uh, if you're planning on having children um, and you're a male. One of them is that, yes. There, in the seminal fluid, whatever, there could be hydroxyurea. Your sperm could be damaged by the hydroxyurea. The other thing is hydroxyurea decreases your sperm count. Now, this is something you really need to discuss with your primary care physicians because stopping hydroxyurea, if it's working for you, is a big deal because it's, it's a really effective medication for making your sickle cell disease better. Um, so you really have to think about, um, you know, if, you, if you're stopping your, your hydroxyurea, but people do recommend that men who want to uh, have children should stop their hydroxyurea. Continuing your hydroxyurea decreases your sperm count, but doesn't make you sterile. So even if you're taking hydroxyurea, you, you are not, you're, you could still father a baby. Um, and a lot of people, uh, women and men, have had children while they were taking hydroxyurea at the beginning of their of their pregnancy, um, and it has does not appear that that has any bad effect on the babies. And I, there are few, uh, I've, I, there's never been a report that I've read of somebody who continued hydroxyurea throughout their whole pregnancy. So no. As far as I know, nobody really knows what happens if you do that. Yeah. 
Hopefully that helps um, with the hydroxyurea. Um, I have another hydroxyurea before I go over to um, this question from a mom who their son has been in the hospital for 42 days and tips to keep him out of the hospital. Um, but before that, any experience with hydroxyurea suppressing hemoglobin? My daughter is 17, been taking hydroxyurea since five, stopped oxbrida, and now hydroxyurea due to suspected suppression. Well, this is my personal opinion. <laughs> um, suppressed bone, bone marrow suppression happens with hydroxyurea, that's for sure. Um, and it, it depends on the severity, et cetera. So I don't know all the details, but my experience has been if you stop the hydroxyurea <clears throat> and the counts all come back, there's two different things you can do. You could either pretend like you've never been on hydroxyurea before, start at a low dose, follow your counts and see if you can in increase, see if your doctor can, in your doctor can increase the dose back to the where it was when you weren't having problems and that it's increasing the fetal hemoglobin and all that the stuff that it does um, and then the other thing to do which in your case may not be the best thing but to stop hydroxyurea for a, a period of time and then just restart it and then check the labs in a couple of weeks or a month just to make sure that it isn't suppressing your hemoglobin. If it's been doing it for over a long period of time, then that's the time to kind of regroup and start over again, figure out what, what dose you were on, maybe that was okay, maybe a lower dose than that. And even low doses of hydroxyurea are, are beneficial. So um, you really need to work it out with your uh, primary care doctor to Oxbrida shouldn't affect your, you know, shouldn't decrease your hemoglobin, but you should go over your, what, how, your doses, what you're taking, the history of it, how it went down and try to work around that somehow. But I've, I had, you know, a fair number of people who had bone marrow suppression and it could have been just because they had a viral illness at the same time. And somehow that, cause it didn't seem to have any, particular pattern but and and the other thing is that most people who I had who had bone marrow suppression with hydroxyurea didn't happen again so I would stop their hydroxyurea restart it check them and I can't recall that anybody that I took care of had to completely stop their hydroxyurea permanently that doesn't mean it can't happen it just means my patients were lucky enough they never had to do that. Okay. Um, kind of along the, the same lines, I have SS and I'm 50 years old. My pain medication is no longer working as before. What can I do? Uh... If you're taking pain medication every day, you, you build up tolerance to pain medication. So the longer you take it, the more you take, the less it's going to work. And that's just the way opioids work. If you take it every single day, at some point, it's just not going to be enough. It doesn't work anymore because your body has has become used to that dose. You know, receptors are changing. It's, you know, there's a there's medic there's medicine behind it and you have to increase your dose and then at that increased dose after a while that's not going to work you have to increase your dose again at some point you're going to start if you take it a lot every you know if you're taking it for a month at a time you're going to start having other effects of the of the uh, of the opioid if you take it intermittently then and 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 you know, like say you, you have a pain episode every two months, and you just notice that, you know, this dose of Dilaudid used to work for me, and it just doesn't work anymore. Then I think you have to 
investigate why that is the case. Because usually if you stop opioids for weeks or a month or whatever, and then you get, have another pain episode and you need to take it again, they, they work about the same. Um, all, you know, everything, it, things change and you may need more or less. Nothing is, everything's static, things change. You have to, um, you have to kind of work with your primary care doctor on what's working for you. And maybe your pain is different and you need to have more. It's, there could be something else going on it has nothing to do with the pain medicine. All right, thank you so much. There's a lot of uh, reproductive questions here. I'll, I'll have, um, I'll, I'll ask, what is what age is best to have kids with, sickle, with the sickle cell patient? The second one is if um, with sickle cell disease, should we plan to go through IVF route if if you have a partner with AS? Okay, so people with sickle cell disease go through menopause early because sickle cell disease affects everything in your body. It affects your sperm count. It affects your ability to ovulate. And so a lot of women maybe 10 years earlier than people who don't have sickle cell disease, they go into menopause, you stop ovulating, and you can't have children anymore. The other thing is, as you get older with sickle cell disease, generally speaking, you develop more problems, you have had sickle cell disease longer, all that kind of stuff. So if you're planning, if, you if you're in a stable relationship and you're planning on having, you wanna have children, don't wait until you're 35, 45 or something like that because you may not be able to have children. So that's that's kind of the thing with, with sickle cell. Also, as you get older, you have more, you know, sickle cell, like Cassandra says, even though I'm sitting here and I look okay, I'm still sickling. So, the, you know, not the younger you are, the better. But then again, if you're really young, that's not good either. So there has to be something where you talk with your hematologist, with OBGYN, and you figure out when's the best time for me to have this child that I want to have. Uh, and then you have to work, you know, there's a lot of, like Cassandra is saying, it's, there's a lot of stuff to do once you are pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Um, and then what was the other question? I can't remember. I'm getting um, It's all right. We, we all are. Um, and I'll just say quickly, I knew I wanted to have a child in my 20s because just for the same reason Dr. Q said, like, I can't even imagine having a child now because I'm always so tired all the time. So, um, you know, I that, that was my same line of thinking as well as like, hey, have a kid in your 20s so that you have energy for them. And that was my thought process around it. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into this, but that was a, a big thing for me was being able to be well enough. And in my twenties, I, I would, cons I, I wasn't in pain as much. I did get my hip replaced and I did have AVN, but that was probably my biggest um, issue at that time. Um, now the issues I deal with are, you know, bone pain pretty con uh, consistently now fatigue um, and just, you know, some little, sickle cell quirks here and there. And so um, I also, you know, in talking to my sister, she wanted to have kids in her 20s as well because, um, you know, she, for the same reason. So um, just really s sit with it and think about, um, you know, what's right for you uh, and really give it, you know, really good thought around it. Um, and yeah, I, I learned actually on one of these live sessions that uh, menopause happens early and sickle cell, I had no idea. And of course, sickle cell affects all of your organs, including, you know, your reproductive organs, right? So um, I, I don't know how many people know about that, but I, I, I feel like that is important to, to make sure you, you do understand, you know, it's a progressive disease or it's a progressive disorder, you know, sickle cell doesn't stop. It's not, you, you're not only having problems with sickle cell only when you're in pain. 
you're sickling all the time. So that damage is being caused all the time. And so the, the goal is really to slow that damage down and, and see what you can do to mitigate it through lifestyle, through medications, through, you know, whatever works best for you. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Um, and that's my two cents on um, figuring out when I wanted to have my daughter. And the other thing is, I think, you know, some people have a lot of, pro even though if you're, even younger people have problems when they uh, have uh, with sickle cell disease when they have children. So yeah, most people don't, but again, you have to be really monitored so that you, that if that something comes up, it gets like, like toxemia, which uh, Cassandra was talking about. So you know when that happens and you get the right care. Yeah, I don't know how y'all do it with more than one kid because I just have one kid and I'm already exhausted tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, I think it, I, I think that, to... I think every every mom that has like more than one kid is exhausted all the time. And I just have <laughs> the one though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. Anyways, um, I have here. Um, a question on if THC CBD helps with pain, would you ever recommend that over Dilaudid? I don't think I'd recommend it over Dilaudid um, <clears throat> because they're not technically pain medications, uh, but they do help you tolerate pain better. Um, and they, they, they subjectively decrease the pain. There was a study um, using uh, cannabinoids at UCSF, and it was, <clears throat> I know this because some of my patients were, so they had to be in the hospital for two weeks. They didn't want you taking, they didn't want you going outside the hospital or getting something from your friends. So, um, and, it, and the, the upshot of it was that taking cannabinoids, and this was marijuana vaporized in a special system, um, did not in, did not change your pain. You, everybody took the same amount of pain medications that didn't decrease pain medications that people were having pain. Um, but it, pro, it, and I can't remember, it was a while ago, I don't know that it, that it even decreased the, 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 their perception of pain. But a lot of people who I took care of felt like those those things helped. Again, you have to be somewhere where it's legal or you're going to get into trouble. With it. In California, you wouldn't get into trouble, but in other states you might. Or other countries, especially. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I just to share my little experience with it. I don't know. Um, I know. Uh, um, gosh, my brain doesn't want to work today. It's Friday. Like I'm done. Um, but um, cannabinoids. They. I know a lot of you all use it. Like you know, topically sometimes, or you know, um, vapor sometimes. And a lot of you say. It helps you with your pain. Um, for me personally, it just made it more apparent. And I was like, ugh, I don't want it. I didn't want it more pronounced, my pain, you know? So I think it really is, you know, um, you know, and it, on an individual basis. I talk with my sister because I think she was on a study too. I, maybe she was even on that study that um, you were talking about, Dr. Q, and she said the same thing for her too. So I don't know how you all, I don't know like how you all make that work for you. Um, if you guys want to share, feel free to share. But for me personally, it just made the pain a little bit more pronounced. It made it more noticeable. Um, and I was a little bit more fixated on the pain. So to each their own. Um, uh, we talked about, you know, the age for um, having a kid, 
But I guess we gave a very female perspective of it. Is there a male perspective? Because it, I think here, and uh, sorry if I am assuming in incorrectly, I just had my 40th birthday and me and my wife are trying to have our first child this year. So I guess I maybe to supplement that question, and I don't know uh, th this person's gender, but on a male perspective, what are your thoughts on, you know, having kids at that age? Well, the same thing that happens with women happens with men. So okay. over a period of time, and with women, it's much more apparent because your period stops or it starts getting really wacky and you go to your OBGY and they say, oh, wow, you're going into menopause and you're only 38, you know. Um, with men, you can't really tell, you know, you don't, unless you check your sperm count, you don't know whether you, whether the infertility is getting dramatically worse. Again, your sperm count goes down, but it doesn't mean you're sterile. Um, so the older you get, the more difficult it is to, for, <clears throat> for anybody to get pregnant and the more complicated locations like if your partner if you're 40 and your partner's 20 okay but if you're if you're 40 and your partner's 39 or somewhere up there being older with with any anybody who's older and, and is pregnant you're going to have more issues and especially if you have sickle cells so like cassandra was saying like I actually didn't know about the, the menopause either for until about 10 years ago or something like that. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the older you get with sickle cell disease on both male and female, it's harder to get pregnant. And if you do, then the pregnancy could be harder just because you're older. Yeah. There's a comment here. I think this person's trying to ask about the difference in pain between uh, sickle beta thalassemia and SS. And, you know, they didn't um, share which sickle beta thalassemia, but just to share sickle beta zero is this, like the same severity as SS. So just because you have sickle beta thal zero doesn't mean you're in less pain than somebody with SS. But to be honest, or to be fair, that that can be the case for any genotype with sickle cell. I, there is a lot of people that I know with SC, which is supposed to be milder, who are in pain more than me with SS, or who get admitted a lot more or, you know, have to stay in hospitals longer. So it really is an individual thing. But I guess uh, if you wanted to go by the textbook, um, sickle beta zero is as severe as SS and sickle beta plus is mild and SC is mild um, compared to SS and sickle beta zero. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I really want to get to this question. That's why I pinned it because somebody asked about the, the advice. This was the second half of the question. Sorry that we lost track <laughs> of that. Um, advice on IVF. Um, and I, I believe this person has sickle cell and their partner has trait. And I know a couple who did actually undergo IVF successfully. Um, and so their child only has trait. Um, so I, I do know that there are couples who do it. I don't know how expensive that is or, you know, what the logistics are. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Q? Well, it is expensive. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. And so it's, um, you know, that, so what the way that works is they give medication to the mom so she super ovulates. And then you collect the... Um, ovum the eggs and you freeze those and then when you when you have then but and you I, I don't I think it's before the freezing they pick out the ones that they look at they what that once they start getting 
they fertilize and they get bigger, you say then to the eight cell stage, they can pick out one cell, they look at the DNA to see whether or not that, that blastomere has sickle cell. And if it doesn't, then that's the one that gets implanted. If it does, then that's not implanted. Um, and this, so you can, you can have a child who has S uh, trait or AA um, doing this in vitro fertilization thing. Each one of those collections of uh, ovum is, uh, I've, you know, I'm just going by what I hear, can be very uncomfortable and uh, takes a lot of time and it's very expensive. So the collection of the ovum is expensive because you have to take these uh, uh, medications and you have to be followed while you're taking them. And then once you ovulate, they have to use laparoscopic surgery to get the eggs so that they can, uh, you know, save those for when they're going to be fertilized. And once they're fertilized, they look at each one of these eight cell stages and take one cell out and figure out which it, whether it has sickle cell disease or not. And they're probably, I don't know the details behind it, but they're probably just looking for sickle cell disease, SS or S beta zero. Um, and they're not definitely looking for, does this ovum or this blastomere, does it have AA or um, AS? They may not get down to that point. And that's why this uh, couple had a baby with AS rather, but you won't have sickle cell. So it's, it is expensive. And I don't think insurance would pay for it. I could be wrong on that. Okay. Um, we actually, I lost track of time, guys. I have to wrap up because I have a call in three minutes. Um, but thank you all so much. If you didn't get your question, I guess the important part I want to share is if you didn't get your question answer, please feel free to send it over to ask at sc101.org and we can continue answering questions there. Um, we will be back in two weeks. Um, and so you can also join our live there. Um, and I'm so sorry that we didn't get to everybody's questions. These are fantastic questions today. I'll hand it over to you for your statement. Dr. Keenan, we'll close out. I just wanna say, if you just came on tomorrow, uh, a uh, NBA basketball player will be inter who has sickle cell disease will be interviewed and he's written a book about his issues. And I think that's really something that, that people would be interested in. So everything you hear on here, Sickle Cell 101 is for sickle cell education. So all this, everything you hear is my opinion. Other doctors may not agree with me for sure. Um, sometimes I may not give a complete answer. There may be things I left out, um, but uh, so so this is just a, a kind of an old doctor giving people information about sickle cell disease. I'm not trying to treat anything, give you advice on therapy. I'm just here to give you information. So that's my little disclaimer. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your fantastic yeah. questions. Maybe yeah. well, this is never long enough. And you guys like y'all like coming towards the end, huh? Y'all <laughs> ask the really good questions at the end when, it, <laughs> when I got to go. Um, <laughs> please feel free to, like I said, send in questions that you you really need an answer to. And then um, if not, we'll see you in two weeks and have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. Enjoy. Hopefully it's a Nice, relaxing weekend for you all. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for coming on and asking all these great questions. Bye, guys. Mm.